Blog Talk Radio. See, I was moving away from the dog to avoid the noise, and I didn't yeah. do it fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa with Love, Life, and Law of Attraction Radio. I'm here with Cassie today. And we are going to be talking about something that I think pretty much everybody in our country and most at this point are dealing with right now, which is how to keep your sanity, like keep your balance, keep your head on straight, and still be on informed, kind of maybe know what's going on in the world if that matters to you. But even if it doesn't, I think the Robin Williams thing this week proves that it's almost impossible to be unaffected. I mean, mm-hmm. there are going to be there are going to be events, there are going to be news stories, there are going to be situations that lead into the community consciousness with such force that no matter how hard you try, it's unavoidable. So yeah, that's what we're talking about today. That's great. I'm excited because I think that's exactly what you said. And I could, you, like, especially, like, the Robin Williams thing hit, Robin Williams, you know, hit every, like, part of my life. And now I have a big comedian, comedian community in my life, and I watched it hit really, really big in their life, you know, and, and on, an, on an even deeper level because I think there's a lot of levels to this. So I'm excited about our topic. I'm going to go, I'm just going to say up front, like, Lisa's probably the more of the expert on this. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I, I said it in our promo. I think that there are some people, you know, there is a contingent of deliberate creators in the world who have a strong personal policy of I don't look. And mm-hmm. that's why the Robin Williams thing was so interesting to me, because you couldn't avoid it. I mean, not looking wasn't going to help. It was going to bleed through anyway. I'm not one of those people. Like, I do watch the news. I follow world events probably closer than most. I'm involved in politics. And my deliberate creator status doesn't really affect that part of me. I mean, I like to think that I do a pretty good job of of managing that, but that's my definition of a pretty good job could be challenged by my husband. He might say otherwise. <laughs> But I mean, what's your what's your approach? I mean, do you watch the news? Do you pay attention? Are you engaged, or do you take more of a hands-on approach with it, or hands-off approach? I am more of a hands-off, like just um, because that is the way that I manage. Like if it touches, you know, like if it comes in enough, I figure if it gets through like that filter of, um, I mean, I don't. Some people really, they actually like aside from being informed or not informed, like there's an element of the news that people like. I'm not a person who generally um, enjoys that, that sort of any type of a show, like news, morning show, whatever, about five minutes and I've had enough. So part of it is deliberate creator and part of it is just who I am. And But I know sometimes like I, there's, I can only handle so much. That's part of it. Because there's only so much... Um, that I, and I don't know if it's the energy or, but I have the desire to manage, like choosing something different when I see something that I don't like. But sometimes it is inevitable, and it was inevitable this week to really, not just to manage my thoughts, but sort of those ripple effects, the things that makes you think about, the things that it reminds you of, the questions it brings up about your own life. Well, I mean, you and I did a show years ago now where we talked about, I think it was Rihanna specifically, like when Rihanna's life was sort of spinning out of control. And we Mm -hmm. talked about a deliberate creator's responsibility in a situation like that. We had a long conversation about choosing how we want to see people, how we want to see situations. And I know that some deliberate creators would say that the best way that they can support the greater good is by not looking at that stuff at all. I disagree. Mm-hmm. Like, I have a strong personal conviction, and I don't hold this for everybody, but my strong personal conviction is as a force of light in the world, as a person who can love at times when others can't because I'm not directly involved, I have mm-hmm. a duty to look at 
you know, Israel and Palestine. I have a duty to look at, you know, Ukraine. I have a duty to look at the things that are going on in Missouri right now and anchor myself tightly in the light and send as much love as I can. Like, I really feel like I'm not doing my part if I'm not engaged enough to send the love and to hold a clear vision of all is well, or at least some some modicum of safety and security. I don't know. I mean, like, I, I feel strongly about that for myself. Yeah, and I see that in you. Like, I see that because you do stay informed. I've been there and I've watched watch the news from you with you and I think I I tend to agree. So when I do see a story and it comes across and I I would say maybe if I didn't spend as much time on Facebook as I do for for business reasons or I'm always popping in and in and out of Facebook. So I'm always seeing that. So I'm t i am do I like the approach and I do take the approach of like sending that love when you when you see the situation come up. And I think for me I think you have the ability, maybe, I don't know, maybe you've just managed it better. But I definitely think you have the ability. I mean, you do exactly what you say. I know that. And so what I'm trying to say is that you might have, like, more of a capacity, more of your energy. And maybe it's even just how we sort of allocate our energy. But I I think a lot of your sending love into the world energy goes into that place. Is that right? It does. And, I mean, you're right, it could be because of the way I'm wired. And I will say that if it hits close to home, I don't function that way. Like, if there's some reason that it's closer than it could be, that breaks down for me. But when it's further out in the world where I don't feel personally affected, that's a pretty easy place for me to stand, which is why I think the whole Robin Williams thing was so pervasive, because if that hit close to home for people, for almost everybody in some way. I mean, it mm-hmm. would be much harder to create distance from that. I mean, let's face it, Robin, well, Robin Williams committed suicide. And, you know, there are wars and genocides and riots and race riots and all of this stuff, and people couldn't take their eyes off Robin Williams. Some people might say that that's a bad spin on our societal condition. <laughs> I think it's a perfectly natural <laughs> response. Because it was very hard not to be personally affected by that story. I think I think that's true, and I think I think there's le- there's layers layers of why that is. But you're right; like it's very hard not to be personally connected. And so I think I think you said a lot of good things that I want to highlight. Like it's Im- it's important to give yourself, even if you're going in, you know, if you're um, you see yourself as someone who adds light to the world, you're a deliberate creator and you're you have your stance of how we how we have the most power. Like one of the things to give yourself a break on is if the story is too close to home. Like mm-hmm. because you said it. Like it's easier to operate and so it is. I agree with you. It's our responsibility when that story is far enough away that we can just send in the love and the light. But it's also really important when we're talking about this to highlight that it's okay to give yourself that break and, and and you know, we'll give some strategies, I think, to manage that side as well, but to not be maybe, I don't want to say not operate as your highest self because I think it is operating as your highest self, but not operating from that sort of, I don't know, all, all above being that can do and, you know, just always be perfect, I guess for lack of a... Do you have a better way to say what I'm trying to say? Uh, I think you're getting it. I mean, I think... Yeah, you're getting it. And I I know for me, sometimes that line can get pretty blurry. I mean, like I said, my husband might disagree on where my line actually is because I can get pretty... I can get really worked up. I can get really passionate. I can get really angry. I can get sort of... I can get wrapped up in the injustice or the intricacies or the complications of things. And I think I'm still okay there, even in the anger. But where I'm not okay anymore is when I start to become afraid. Like, that's my cue to disengage. I mean, I think anger can be really righteous. I'm, honestly, I'm really pissed off 
about all of the stuff that's going on in Ferguson, Missouri right now. I mean, I'm incensed. I am livid. I have a lot of energy. But I think that in that place, I'm still, I can still be a force for life standing right there. But when I get afraid, I have to unplug. I like that. I like that. Um, I think that's a good, yeah, because we don't operate, like, nobody operates well in fear. Like, that's not where any of your best, but you're right. Like, even once you're at the point of anger, you can you can channel that energy to what you want. Like, and if you honor that, because you have to honor, I think, you have to honor who you are in in all these situations, in what you see about yourself and what you think about the world and what, you have to be really present. We say this a lot on the show, but being present with yourself, being um, current about what what does make you feel fear and what doesn't. Right, because fear is not a vibe that I want to be sending any place. And, I mean, maybe anger is not appropriate anyway, but I'll give myself a pass there. Other people wouldn't give themselves a pass there. Like I have right. some close friends who have, you know, the Palestinian-Israeli situation causes them to be very angry. And so that is their cue to completely unplug. Like that part Mm -hmm. of knowing yourself, like you said, where your lines are is really, really important. And I do, I mean, for those people who just choose not to look at all, I get that too. I really do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think think we all have our specials. And no matter why they are there, like it's always about, um, yeah, honoring where your place is and knowing where your place where your place in that is. And as long as you can manage there, then then you're okay to stay. But as long as it but if it turns to something you don't want, like in the case where you said your friends that do the anger thing, like that's sort of where I get to. And I mine is less I get anger, but once I hit the hopeless, once I can't find right. Once I can't, once I can't stay in there and ha- hold the vision of the world that I want to hold, the 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 vision that that I want to be created, I have to get out because my vision is stronger when it's a little disconnected from reality than it is sitting right there in it trying to resist against it. So, yeah, I mean, resistance is a powerful force. I mean, we we. To, Deliberate creators in general talk about resistance as being a really, really bad thing, like anything you're resisting persists. And I think that's why a lot of people would say don't look at all. I mean, because anything that you resist persists. You're feeding that energy. I get that for sure. And I also get that it's exactly what you said, that hopeless feeling. I mean, back to the Middle Eastern conflict, it's really easy to feel hopeless about that that is a bad energy to be contributing to that situation and, the, you know, in the consciousness at large. It's much mm-hmm. better to unhook from that and find something that you can feel, you know, hopeful about or joyful about and contribute that energy into the force. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think, you know, you've, you've written this in blog posts, so we might have talked about it on shows, but as a good way to find that, um, that place when there's a natural disaster, you'll often write like the best thing we can do is see those people as happy, healthy, and recovered, and I, and and love our lives the way they are. And I think when you see that stuff that might make you feel hopeless, like and and I would like you to talk about your process for this too. But I mean, one of the things that I do is like it's like what do I want to see? What do I want to feel? What do I want to see and feel in the world? And no, and I'll go to that place, whether that means going and hanging out with the children in my life, or that means laughing, or that means just being grateful that I can sit down in peace and read a book. Like, I believe that energy contributes as much as being aware and, and navigating. What are your thoughts on that? I agree. I do agree with that. I mean, my process is a little bit different in that. I mean, I think for myself, I like to remind myself how powerful I am. And I like Mm -hmm. to remind myself that I don't have to be afraid, you know, particularly natural disasters, because we all sort of feel like that could happen anywhere. I mean, sitting there, something could happen here. I mean, there's all the, but 
that as a powerful, deliberate creator, I don't have to be afraid. And I will typically break it down to a very small, like a sort of micro level of engagement. Like think about one person in that situation, one child, somebody that I've seen a picture of. Some Find one image or one mental image of somebody who's there and anchor that for them. Like go to my life and channel the comfort and channel the love and channel the safety and the security to, you know, the the joy for just that one person and kind of let it radiate out from there. Like where that big, huge situation might be so overwhelming, there was that one woman sitting at the side in the picture. I can relate with her. And then, I, like I said, I let that let love grow from that one place rather than trying to focus on the whole horrible thing. And that process makes me feel empowered because, again, it reminds me that I am a powerful creator, that I do have some control over what I contribute there, and, you know, that individual connection feels much more manageable to me than the big, overwhelming shit show. Right. I love that, actually. I like that picking one person and really channeling to them. I think that's a cool process. And it feels, um, to me, it feels very powerful than trying to, like, anchor something to the whole situation. It feels really powerful to impact one person. Because we, like you said, that radiates out. And that is someplace I can relate, like that one point. But, you Mm -hmm. know, that's not going to work for everybody. It works for me. It's just important to me that we all remember that we're much more powerful than we think that we are when we're afraid. I mean, when we see those things and experience these things in the large consciousness that trigger us, we are infinitely more powerful than we are when we're afraid. I think that's part of why sometimes we turn away. I mean, if for a deliberate creator, it might be different. Maybe they turn away intentionally. But I mean, Humans in general don't like to witness suffering. I mean, humans in general will always turn away because Mm -hmm. it hurts to watch it. And I don't want, my for myself, I don't want to make that choice. If I'm turning away in fear, again, I don't want to be in fear either way. So a deliberate choice to turn away is different than that instinct that this is frightening and overwhelming. Right. I also think that even for a deliberate creator, you're deluding yourself if you think you're not affected, even if you're not looking. Right. I mean, of right. course you're affected. I mean, you may not even know it's happening, but you're affected. I mean, we're all operating on this plane together, and we're all very connected. And so not looking doesn't necessarily mitigate the impact. Right. That's true, because you can be in resistance even in not looking. You can be in resistance in not looking. I mean, if another human next to you is suffering, you feel that suffering and you don't know why. I mean, mm-hmm. we're, we're wired with mirror neurons. I mean, we are survival of the species depends on our ability to feel each other's pain to some degree. And you're affected even when you're not looking on some level. So for myself, I feel more empowered in that effectiveness by at least taking that moment to anchor in love. I like that. And I also like you're really conscious about choosing the empowered place. I think that's key. Right. I try. I'm good at it most of the time, not all of the time. So should we talk about what to do if you find yourself impacted by some of this stuff? Yes. Because you will eventually at some point. You probably did this week. So what are some of your strategies? Um, one of, like, so one of my strategies is really to take, like, to take that deep breath and that step back and a little bit of quiet time to figure out, um, to sift and sort a little bit. Um, because of different things that we've talked about, you know, um, you know, Israel and Palestine versus Robin Williams versus what's going on in Missouri, like, those are all very different things. And so some of those might affect you from the suffering nearing point that you're talking about. And some of them very may well trigger deep 
deep fears and emotions in you on a different level. And so I think that, that rather than just being in that sort of overwhelm where I don't feel good about this place is really identifying what you feel because it might be grief. It might be just overwhelming sadness. It might be anger like we've talked about, like taking that moment to step back and identify what is this, like, A, what feeling is it triggering because that's going to help you navigate, I think. And then also, like, is this, is this mine is it, or is this sort of that mirroring thing? Like what about, you know, Robin Williams' life might trigger a fear in me or something in me versus, you know, what's going on in Missouri? How do those things impact me personally and what are my thoughts? What are my actual thoughts about them? Like really getting some quiet time to figure out what am I thinking and, again, what am I get clear on what am I feeling? Like that's my first step. Well, and I want to highlight what you just said. I mean, there's a difference between mirroring sort of that natural, empathic, or compassionate response that we have to suffering and being triggered. I mean, those are two different things. I think what you just said is really brilliant because unless you're willing to sit with that question, you might not know what's happening to you. Like, there are aspects of the Palestinian conflict that trigger me. It's not a mirroring scenario. And knowing that trigger about myself helps me in a couple ways. First of all, it helps me to back myself down. Like, oh, Mm -hmm. I know what that is. So take a breath, relax. Like, I'm familiar with that. That triggering thing is very different. So, yeah, ditto, hallelujah, because that's smart to be able to sort that out. I think Mm -hmm. the next thing I would do is, give myself and everybody around me a little bit more in terms Uh of faith and comfort. Because if I'm affected, I'm going to not be operating at my highest capacity in the world. But if I'm affected, those around me probably are too. And I see this happen a lot in, you know, relationships or, you know, couples where something goes on and one person's kind of falling apart and it can be difficult to deal with the fact that other people are also agitated. Other people are also a little short-tempered. Other people are also a little prickly around the edges. And so taking that space to know that I am prickly, I am agitated, and the people around me maybe also gives me a stronger sort of, a, a larger space for compassion all the way around. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. I think that's that is key to remembering. Especially, I suppose the next one, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, like, especially, I I think that's good in general, like, because even if you're only mildly affected, someone else may be really affected. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the next one that we might, I'm surprised we both didn't lay it out there first. Do you want to guess what I would say we both would have laid out there first? An intention? No, but that was good, too. I would say double down on self-care. Oh, yeah. Like, just know that this is happening and that you, even if you're not sure, but you may be affected. Like, really, part of that compassionate space, like giving yourself much more love and self-care. I mean, I think that self-care is sort of the key to navigating tricky territory in general because it gives you the energy that you need to process what's coming. And some people might say process first, but I always say self-care first. Like, get your self-care on board, amp up your energy so that you have the bandwidth to actually process what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And And I think... You know, we talk a lot about self-care, so we don't necessarily have to go to the list. I want to highlight, like, the most important part, or maybe two, like drinking water and getting enough sleep are key, especially the sleep. I mean, they're both equally important, but we don't think about extra rest sometimes as being self-care. But in a situation that might be um, needing more energy or, um, yeah, needing more energy to navigate, like you said, like, Sleep is number one self-care, 
I think, that extra making sure that you have, if you're going to be um, expending more energy, making sure that you're replenishing that and then some. And sleep is a good example. I mean, when the sh- when it's kind of all hitting the fan, sleep can be the thing that is most difficult to come by. But right. I know for me, because I do have a tendency to get worked up on stuff like that, that can be, that can be my indicator that I've gone off the deep end. <laughs> good indicator, <Right>. huh? <laughs> Quinn, I realize <laughs> I'm still laying awake at 1 o'clock in the morning going, oh, but what about this or what about this? Like, that might be my cue to unplug. And, yeah, sleep is a big deal. Self-care in general tends to be the first thing that goes when we're in crisis, and yet it's the thing that we most need when we're in crisis. I think a big part of self-care at times like this might be finding somebody that you can talk to about how you're feeling, even if it doesn't make sense. Because I can't – I mean, how many people – were affected by Robin Williams' death, but then excused themselves by saying, I don't understand why, it's not like I knew him, I feel silly, but da 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 I mean, we had, uh, unfortunately, highly unfortunately, a little girl in our community who went missing and was found dead. And the news media did, like, an exceptional job, I thought, of encouraging people to talk about their feelings about that and not feel silly for being very affected when they didn't know this little girl. But having somebody to talk to who you can share those feelings with in the kind of a non-judgment zone, I think is a huge part of self-care. Huge part. Huge part. I even, I, I mean, I saw a, a, a Facebook post from a, you know, a comedian friend of mine who said exactly that. It was thanking someone for, like, the talk and the cry he didn't know that he needed. Which I think is maybe the next step. I mean, that's just talking to somebody, I mean, however you do it. But once you've kind of sorted out whether you're being just mirror affected or triggered, and you've done some self-care, you've you've given yourself and the people around you some space and some latitude, I do think it is important then to actually process. And that might sound so incredibly simple or obvious, but it's not. Because I think Uh sometimes people get so wrapped up in their feelings that they don't take the time to process them. They just hope they blow over. They they hope it's going to go away. And it might. I mean, it likely will. But chances are, if you were affected, Thing there that you can grow with and learn from if you're willing to take the time to actually process it. Excuse me, exactly. I think that's key. I think getting to that process state is important, and I think having that self-care on board is key to getting getting through to that place where you can learn something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's I mean, I'm sure clients of mine and probably clients of other coaches get very frustrated. Like, people want to get in and do the – they want to process sometimes. They really Mm -hmm. want to do that. And very often, I will put the brakes on the process. (laughs) Like, not today. (laughs) You've got to be healthy. You've got to be well. You've got to have enough to get through this so that the processing is good and not bad. Like, you need to make sure that you're physically stable and physically strong and – and it doesn't, I don't think it takes long. I mean, a couple of days of really taking exceptionally good care of yourself probably opens a window to process whatever pain or sadness or grief that you're feeling. But I think it's important to note that the energy needs to be on board, particularly if you're in a situation where you can afford yourself that. I mean, if you're in the red hot crisis, if you are in Ferguson, Missouri right now, you don't mm-hmm. have time to go to the spa. I mean, the the right. spa day is off the calendar. But right. for the rest of us who might support them energetically, we do. Right. We do. And and that's one thing, again, is like supporting that, you know, because we, we talked a little bit about, in the beginning about that overall consciousness. But, um, and so being healthy ourselves contributes to that, you know, right, where you just said, like, you can't do it if you're in it. 
but if you're if you're a step or two outside of it, you can and you can con- contribute to that overall state of well-being and healthy self-care. Agreed. So, can you think of any other steps? I think that's all. I think that's and, all uh, too. Like I my think... my end would be find the joy, like then find some joy. Like process and right. then really find the joy. Like after you've processed, like invest heavily in, you know, getting back to that space of joy. Well, and I I mean kind of on a side tangent, I would also say particularly if you feel affected and it doesn't make sense, process it mm-hmm. anyway. Because I think in this right. very non linear world that we live in, I mean some of us who might be empathic, who might be more connected, who might be more sensitive. At times of crisis, I honestly believe some of us are called to process for others. I mean, Mm -hmm. I might be called on in the grand scheme of things to process the suffering of somebody who can't because they're in it. Like the least amount of sense it makes might make it even more important that you actually do the work that you're being emotionally pulled to do. I I think that's an important part, you know, to really, yeah, acknowledge that. Like, you, especially if it doesn't make sense. And I and I like the, I like that. I mean, I suspect that we have a larger percentage of our audience than some shows that are particularly sensitive. And for those people who are particularly sensitive, these can be very rocky times. I mean, yeah. I was getting ready to board an airplane when I got the text message from somebody I believed. Like, I mean, in the beginning with the Robin Williams thing, we all thought it was a hoax. But when I got that one text message from somebody that I believed, like, my first thought was I need to go home and take care of myself because this this could be a bumpy ride. Yeah. So it's totally a buzzkiller. Can I just say that? Like, in terms of, like, really talk about sober up and go home from vacation really quick. That did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can, yeah, it did. It, yeah, it had some, it definitely had impact. And I think, yeah, I think it's important. And it's right. Our, our audience is probably feeling everything that's going on a little bit stronger than some other shows. So, okay, I think we wrapped this one up. I think we did. So, so we awesome. will be oh. yeah, talking over each other. I was just going to say we'll be back next week. Do you want to tell everybody where they can find you? Yeah, you can find me at CassieParks.com. And where can we find you? LisaMHayes.com. We'll be back next week. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.